Okay. Hey, everybody. Hey. I hope you're doing all right. Um, this is really late for me, so um, hopefully my brain is going to continue working through the entire class period and, in fact, into the next one. Um, I don't actually require on a regular basis that my brain continue working very hard after about 8 o'clock at night, so we'll just have to see how this is going to go. But you guys should be okay because we'll be out of here before that. Um, I am going to do a lot of kind of talking at you in lecture style here, but I will um, stop fairly frequently and ask you for feedback. So I want to encourage you to feel free to respond, please, to my feedback and also to ask questions as we go along. If things occur to you um, that you would like to understand better, um, please go ahead and ask about that. And uh, I would rather have us stop and clear something up than, uh, than have us get through all the information that I planned, but then have it not be very clear or useful to you because we didn't stop and clear something up. OK? And I really like it when you nod at me, or even when you say things like, yes, Dr. Burchard. Oh, good, Dr. Burchard. That's wonderful, Dr. Burchard. So if you feel so moved to respond in those ways, please do. Well, that will be absolutely fine. OK, so what we are talking about this evening is um, a topic in ethics that is actually another theoretical approach. So although Professor Harvey just told you that what you do in this class is applied ethics, and that is correct, you do your applied ethics from the standpoint of having learned enough about theoretical eth ethics that you can take that theoretical stuff and then apply it, right? So this is another theoretical approach in ethics that we're going to do some work on tonight, um, hopefully to put you in the position of being able to do a very basic application of it and understand some of the basic concepts and structures that go into an ethics of care. So it is quite different from uh, many of the other, well, it's quite different from most of the theories that you have looked at so far. Um, it tends to vary from them in some really important ways. One of the things that makes it quite different from what you have mostly read so far is that it's contemporary. So one of the early theorists in the ethics of care is Nell Noddings. She is a philosopher of education at Stanford University, actually an alive person. So this is contemporary work. This is work that people are doing right now. Um, this is theory that has been developed over the last, well, really since uh, the late 1970s. In philosophical time, that's like, it's not long, right? Because we kind of measure things in centuries. And so this is really, really recent for us. It's also very strongly um, kind of grounded in feminist theory. So this is a theoretical approach to ethics that grew out of women's work in ethics, recognizing that, noticing that, the theoretical approaches to ethics that they were being taught seemed to them not really to respond to their own experiences of ethical thinking and ethical action. So women started looking at the field of ethics and saying things like, well, how come this set of theories doesn't really describe my experience? Because our theories should describe people's experience, right? Yes, they should. That would be really helpful. So if they don't describe my experience, then that's a reason for me to take another look at those theories and, and ask some questions about what we might need to do with our theories in order to make them more amenable to you know, my experience. Of course, it could also make us ask, well, what's different about my experience that makes it not fit so well with these other theories? Um, OK, so Nell Noddings is one of the early theorists of care. She wrote the first sustained 
theoretical account of caring as an ethics. So caring is you know, just a kind of ordinary part of human life, right? We care for others. We care for things. We care about others and about things. right? That's just an ordinary part of our lives. But it can also be theorized as a location for ethics. That is, we can use caring as a concept to structure our understanding in a broader way of what it is that is good for us to do and what it is that's not good for us to do. Right? Again, on a larger scale or in a larger sense. Not just for me as a particular individual, but can we say something more broadly about what people in general should be doing or could be doing? So what is it to care? Well, basically, caring is responding to the needs of those with whom we are in relationship. In particular, in this version of the ethics of care, that is in Nodding's version of the ethics of care, we will do this in accord with an ideal of our best caring self. So this is an approach to ethics and moral thinking and decision making that is not grounded in principle. It doesn't give you a principle or a rule and say, here, take this principle or rule and apply it to your specific situation. What it does is ask you to consider what it's like to be in relationships. And then it asks you to consider what it has been like for you as an individual, when you have been in a relationship and some event in that relationship has prompted you to act in a caring way towards another, and you have seen yourself as responding very well to that. So Nodding's idea is that all of us can put together a, an ideal picture of ourselves as good carers by looking at the moments in our lives when we have cared as well as we can, or we have really done well for others in terms of how we've cared for them. And we can use that then as a model for what it is like for us specifically to care for other people. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Caring then requires a commitment to act, or at least to think seriously about what actions might be taken on behalf of the one that we are caring for. Caring is directed toward the situation as it is now. It's concrete and in the moment, but it is motivated toward actions that can respond to the needs that are present in that moment. So the key feature of caring, or another key feature of caring, is that it requires a commitment to act. So one distinction we can make with regard to the ethics of care is that it's one thing to say, I care about, and it's another thing to say, I care for. Well, what's the difference? One difference might be that caring about tends to stay at the level of talk. So if I care about something, I might talk about it a lot, but I might not do anything. But caring for requires me to actually do something. So that also means that the ethics of care is very action-oriented. It's very much focused on what you're going to do. And that's part of the way that we will evaluate ourselves as carers is in terms of whether we do something or whether we don't. OK, ethical caring is a matter of choice. And consequently, again, part of the evaluation of caring is directed toward the intention of the one caring. That is, the one who does the caring is making a choice to do that caring. You feel a commitment to care, 
but you still have to make the choice to do the caring. So the intention of the carer is involved in our evaluation of whether that caring works or not. There are two types of caring. Again, this is Nell Nodding's version. And, uh, and I would, I'll just remind you that there are several different versions of the ethics of care. And they have different articulations, right? They lay it out in different ways, emphasize different things. There are pieces of Nodding's view that I really particularly think are good. So that's the one that I'm drawing on mostly here. So Nodding says we can differentiate between natural caring and ethical caring. Natural caring is the caring we do for those that we have a natural relationship bond with. So for instance, you know, if things go well in your life, you will have a natural caring bond with, say, people in your family. It's not automatic necessarily. It doesn't always go like that. But if things have gone well, then you will probably have a natural caring bond for people in your family, right? Yeah, probably most of you have a natural caring bond with people in your family. OK, so when you have a natural caring bond with someone, you actually find it fairly easy to care for them because you want to. The relationship bond that you have with those people creates an impulse for you to want to care for them. To, because you want things to be good for them, right? That's part of what caring for them means. You want things to be good for them. So when something happens that is not good for them, you will have what feels to you like a pretty natural impulse to try to fix that situation, to try to make things be good for them, to try to make the situation different so that things will be good for them. Right? Does that make sense? Anybody have kids? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, so like natural caring, a natural relationship bond, like a, like a blood bond for parents or something? That could be it, although so like bonding with parents doesn't have to be a blood bond either. If you're adopted, it could be a, just could be a constructed relationship bond, but it could be just as deep, right? Yeah, but certainly we think about blood bonds as that kind of bond. Yes, and that makes us want to sing songs like, right? Stings. Everybody knows, you know who Sting is, right? Yeah. That, that's not too old. Right? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a song that I like a lot. It's called, uh, what is it called? Something about justice. And, and the song says, love is stronger than justice, thicker than blood. You like that one? Yeah, so this is the chorus. Love is stronger than justice. Love is thicker than blood. Love is stronger than justice. Love is a big, fat river in flood, which I like <laughs> because it suggests the kind of hugeness that love can carry, right? It can be overwhelming at times and not always in a super good way. So yeah, fun song. Anyway. Anyway, so you can have relationships on the basis of many kinds of things. In families, often that will be a relationship of blood, but also of um, close living, right? And working together for mutual goals and uh, familiarity and right, all kinds of things make up those bonds in family, not just the blood ties that make it so that, you know, again, anybody got kids? Anybody is a parent? Nobody else has parents yet? Good, you're on the right track, Just, you know. You've got time, hold off on that for a while. But one of the things that you will probably find as parents is it's very, very difficult and painful to see your children have problems, especially significant problems. Right? And it's very, very easy to want to fix those problems for your children, which is not always a bad thing. But you do hit points 
where it also becomes important to let your kids struggle with their own problems. And that can be really difficult, really painful. Again, because when you care, you don't want to see someone that you care for struggling or hurting or suffering or doing badly or any of those descriptors, right? Okay, all right. Ethical caring, on the other hand, is caring that we do in response to the ideal of natural caring. The ideal of the caring self, my best caring self. So we're likely going to pull that ideal of the best caring self out of our natural caring. So for instance, it's very, very common for parents to think about their best caring selves as moments when they have, in fact, cared for their children. But you can also think about it in terms of caring for a sibling, or caring for a romantic partner, or caring for a good friend, right? Any of those can work. The point is that ethical caring takes a different kind of effort and commitment on our part and is much more conscious. Because in ethical caring, what we are doing is responding to a situation in which we do not have a natural caring bond established already with the person that needs our care, right? So if you think, for instance, about wandering around on campus, and if you were to, say, see someone fall down and hurt themselves, if you don't know who that person is, you don't have a natural caring bond with that person already established. So you might be tempted to just say, ah, I got to, ah, I have things to do. Somebody else will just take care of this. It's not, ah, I, oh, OK. Whereas if it were your best friend who was walking with you, fell down, hurt themselves, I gotta hope you would not be saying to yourself, oh, I'm, I was, okay, but I've got this meeting, and so, you know, somebody else will help you. It'll be okay, right? I was just saying, what, what point does ethical caring morph into natural caring? It might never. But, but it can, correct? It could, certainly. It would do that at the moment when you really develop a natural caring bond with that person. But unless you develop a natural caring bond or a deeper caring bond with that person, it probably won't. It will continue to function on the level of ethical caring. So the idea of ethical caring is that when we encounter people who need help from us, who need our care, we have options. Again, it, this is a matter of choice. And if we can see those people as people who need our care, and if we can call on our ideal caring selves and make an actual conscious commitment <laughs> to respond to them as though we were helping someone that we actually cared about, that's when we are caring in an ethical way. Does that make sense? Now that doesn't mean that when we care for someone with whom we've got a natural caring bond, that that's not ethical. It just means that the basis for it is not the ethical relationship, but it's the more natural relationship. So genuine ethical caring arises from our settled conviction that to care is better than both not caring and other forms of relationship. It arises out of our desire to see ourselves as our best selves. That is, it arises out of our desire to see ourselves as morally good people, as excellent people. And to continue to see ourselves as good, not just in this moment, but also into the future, as we continue to care for this person or for the next person who comes along and needs our care. Does that make sense? OK. 
Okay. Now, this is all grounded on an ontological principle. That is, the principle that relationship is ontologically basic. So, what is ontological? What does it mean to say that relationship is ontologically basic? Good new vocabulary word for you. Nobody? See, you really need to take those classes. Philosophy, cl no, I'm just kidding. I mean, only based off of the slide. I'll assume that it's, it's something that you have to have to make, to make life worth it to you. No, it's actually even deeper than that. To say that something is ontological is to say that it is the stuff of being. Is to say that it is, it's what being is, really is. So ontology is the study or the science of being. And to say that something is ontological then is to say that it is related to the beingness of the world, the way that the world is in existence. So to say that something is ontologically basic is to say that it is basic to our ability to be the kind of being that we are. Got that? It just feels a little contradictory to me. Really? Contradictory how? I was always trying to do unto others as you would have to do unto yourself. And that to me makes sense to me. But that's a statement of relationship, isn't it? Yeah, that's not, I'm not going to deny that fact. Yeah, so it that's a statement about, that about how to be in relationship. And depending on how basic you want to make that claim, you could make that be an ontologically basic claim too. Right? You could say, this is what it means to be human, yeah. to act in this way. I agree with that. Good. Yay. So the idea that relationship is ontologically basic, what Nottings is saying here is that we are the kinds of creatures that require relationship. We don't do our lives without relationship. We can't. We're not capable of it. We have to be in relationship. Another way to say this would be to talk about us as interdependent beings. We depend on others always for almost every aspect of our lives. And certainly, at particular times of our lives, we depend absolutely, completely on others to the point where literally we don't survive <coughs> without the care of other people, right? <coughs> yeah? I don't like it. Don't like it? No. Why not? Isn't it hard to be like self-sufficient? Is it? Yeah, probably. But I don't know. What would that even mean? Don't go out anyone else but yourself. That would be so nice. Would it? See, I just think that, that would be, it would be empty. You know, don't have to be multiplying that everybody else is unimportant. Well, so, you know, one thing to think about is, well, what are the kinds of rhetorics you've been encouraged to believe in the world that you've grown up in? One of them certainly is a lot of stuff about individuality and independence, isn't it? I think you've probably heard that way more than the story about interdependence. So this might come as sounding like a kind of contradictory story to the one that you have grown up with or to some of the ones that you've grown up with. If, you have been, if you've been brought up to think of yourself 
as needing to be self-sufficient, or not needing, but as wanting that because you've been taught this is the good way to be, then absolutely, it's gonna, this is going to sound to you like, well, phew, just like you're saying. I don't think I like that. We also have control issues, right? And the idea of self-sufficiency partly means nobody's telling me what to do. But of course, that's probably an illusion because you're actually being told what to do all the time. Yeah, please. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think that being self-sufficient, I don't think that in order to be self-sufficient that you need to be without relationships. Like, I think that, you know, like, relationships with your family, with your siblings, if anything, like, you care about those people, and, like, they don't take away from your, like, self-sufficiency, it's just, it's a network of, like, support that, so one way to think about it is that other people's support is what makes it possible for you to be as self-sufficient as you are. Um, I guess I, I, mean, I agree uh, from like a general standpoint, but there are, of course, people who do choose to be completely alone. Not often, right? And it could be different brain chemistry or makeup or whatever, or it could be something that happened that was traumatic, or you know, I mean, it could be what right anyway um so i guess it's like a basic rule of thumb but that doesn't mean that every single person is going to follow suit because there are some people over the course of humanity who have not wanted to be to have interpersonal relationships or any kind of relationships right well um i'm not sure that uh, that i've ever seen anything that i think would count as a real example of that um certainly people have expressed a desire <coughs> to be alone and to not have to be in relationship with other people, to not depend on them. But at very basic levels, um, I'm not sure I've seen any really good examples of how you do that. Uh, except for, for, maybe you're thinking of things like uh, religious hermits or something who go into the wilderness and somehow manage to live there and which I guess you'd argue that the relationship is with a higher power that they're choosing. But still, I mean, there are people who do wander off into the woods and then never come back. You know, I mean, I know it's very rare. I'm just saying, like, mm -hmm. there, I mean, there are examples of that, right? So it's like a general rule of thumb, but mm -hmm. for every general rule of thumb, there's going to be outliers, right? Yeah, sure, there could be exceptions. Um, the standard, though, is pretty certainly that, that people need relationships. Now, even those people who wander off into the woods, generally speaking, don't do that until they're adults or closer to adults. They've had a lot of relationships and an awful lot of caring in their lives before they get to that point. So what has made it possible for them to go off into the woods and do that, so to speak, is the support that's been given to them before that. I guess I would fall into the hermit category. You're a hermit? Not so much a hermit, but I don't have a lot of relationships. I, I call Mondays are Monday Monday. I call them Monday every Monday. Uh -huh. But other than that, I come to school, I go home, I study. I have, for years, for a variety of reasons, kind of pushed my family away just because of different belief systems. Mm -hmm. So hermit, no, but self-reliant, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. I'm going to push back just a little bit. So um, how would you manage to go to school without a whole lot of sort of relationships with other people? The A. Oh, but that requires relationships with other people, right? If you consider a relationship with the government. But you don't interact with a faceless government every time you need something, do you? Aren't there well, no, I mean, real we have, people? We have healthcare there. Mm -hmm. It's not someone that I would call or shoot an email to. Hey, how you doing? I mean, it's a it's a professional relationship. It's not a personal relationship. Well, right, but so so relationship being ontologically basic is not actually singling out personal relationships as the form of relationship that is ontologically basic. What it's saying is 
being in relationship is the way that we navigate the world. But is that care? Not necessarily. Not so these are just, we're talking two separate concepts. Right? We're talking about one concept that underlies another. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a kind of scaffolding there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're not presupposing that all of the relationships that we get something from are going to be personal, caring relationships. In fact, we're presupposing that the range of relationships that we have during the course of our lives is going to be very, very wide. So, for instance, some of the relationships that you depend on very heavily to make your lives work are, say, economic relationships, right? Relationships with the grocery store. People at the grocery store, right? Because if we didn't have people doing that kind of thing, most of us wouldn't eat anywhere near as well as we do. So lots of different kinds of relationships, right, in our interdependency here. The ones that we will foreground will probably be the ones that we have the most personal sense of connection with. But there are other relationships that are very, very important to us that enable us to do the kinds of things that we want to do and to live the kind of life that we want to live. And without those relationships, we would find it very difficult to live the kind of life that we want to live. So, you know, so, so here I am. I'm a philosophy professor. I'm in a university. Without relationships with students, I'm going to have a lot more trouble living this kind of life. Including noisy students in the hall. It's not that every relationship that I have with every student is going to be a very close personal relationship. That would be a disaster. But. There's something really, really important about those relationships in that they make it possible for me to be the kind of person I want to be, a teacher, right? Does that make sense? Presumably, you as students need teachers, need relationships with teachers. Again, those presumably are mostly not going to be close personal relationships, but you still need those relationships. especially when it times to get, comes time to get those letters of recommendation. OK. All right, so this also means that the source of my obligation to care then is the value that I place on relatedness. So what is this saying? I have an obligation to care for others. So what is obligation? Yeah, duty, a requirement, a moral requirement. There's a moral requirement on me to care for others. And the source of that moral requirement, the, the binding force of it, is just the value that I place on being related to others. Recognizing the importance of my relationships recognizing how much they matter in my life, recognizing how much I need them to continue to go forward in my life. That is the source of my obligation to care. Does that make sense? It's the importance of relationship and the crucial aspect of caring in a relationship the recognition that relationship is ultimately what makes life worth living, but also what makes life even work. And that consequently tending to those relationships forms the foundation for my living and working in the world. That makes relationship my first consideration in any moral situation. That is, if I am working from the perspective of an ethics of care.
if I'm an ethics of care person. So one of the questions we could ask about this is, well, why are we, why are we setting up this ethics according to a rule, or sorry, an ideal rather than a rule or a principle. So you've seen ethics models so far, right, that work according to a rule or a principle, right? What's one of the ones that you've seen that works according to rule or principle? Utilitarianism. Utilitarianism. Basic utilitarian rule says that uh, we work. <laughs> Well, the greatest good for the greatest number is an idea. But what's the rule? The greatest good for the greatest number. But what's the rule? A rule tells you what to do. Right? So what's the rule? Isn't it the rule of universability? Oh, that's kind of a different rule. That sounds a little more deontological. Oh, that's the wrong one. When you're faced with a decision, you choose the one that... Causes greatest good for the greatest number. Yeah, yeah. I'm, please repeat that a little louder so everybody can hear. Whenever you are faced with a decision, you choose the decision that leaves the largest amount of people that are right. Yeah. Right. A rule tells you how to act. So the utilitarian rule, basic utilitarian rule says act in ways that will create, okay, you could do it this way, act in ways that will create the greatest good for the greatest number. Right? That tells you what to do. So why would we want to move towards an ideal rather than using a rule or a principle like that? Well, one reason is the ideal avoids the difficulties of universalizing, which is where you were going to go. An ideal is more flexible. That allows us to recognize that what it means to care will differ appropriately in different situations. What will be universal is the commitment to the maintenance of a caring relation. A commitment to the maintenance of relationships through caring. Another reason to go with an ideal is that the ideal allows us to, and actually requires us to, exercise our moral imagination and empathy in thinking through what our best moral self might do in any given situation. So remember, that's what the ideal is that we're talking about. It's my best moral self. What is my best? So instead of asking, you know, what would Scooby do? You are saying, what would I do in my best caring self. When I'm doing the best job I possibly can of caring, what would I do? What would it look like in this situation? We can access our moral sensibilities by asking questions like, well, what would I do here if this were the person I care about most in the world? And imagining the answers that we might come up with. Right? Does that make sense? So when I'm walking out on the quad and somebody that I don't know falls down and says, ow, that really hurt, and I think I broke something, what I can do is say to myself, OK, I don't know this person at all, and I have a meeting to go to, and I've got 40 papers to grade, and I have, you know. But that would all still be the same if this were my best friend or if this were my son. Actually, I should probably go with my best friend at this point, because my son, oh. <laughs> 18, we might not. No, I'm just kidding. But sometimes it's easier to think about different versions, right? But if this were the person who were my best friend, all these other things would still be true. I would still have a meeting. I'd still have 40 papers to grade. I'd still have a million other things that I need to do. But I wouldn't walk away from my best friend in pain, right? So imagining my best caring self in this situation helps me see what I believe is the best thing to do. It helps me see 
how to value relationship even when I don't have an already existing relationship with this person. What I have is the possibility for a future relationship. And that's valuable to me too. Does that make sense? So I would imagine what I would do if this were someone that I cared for naturally. And then I would transfer that solution to this situation and say, okay, what that means for me is that this is what this situation calls for. So I'm stopping. I'm offering any immediate assistance and first aid that I'm capable of. I'm pulling out my phone and I'm calling emergency services and I'm getting somebody here to take care of this person in the ways that I'm not capable of doing but in the ways that have to be done in order to move them further in getting the care that they need. Does that make sense? So this idea that we can call on an ideal, imagine ourselves doing well, and then act according to that picture, helps us exercise a couple of faculties that I think are hugely important for any kind of ethics, any kind of moral ability. And that's our moral imagination and our empathy. Right? So what's empathy? Yeah, your ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes, your ability to feel what other people might feel, your ability to understand what other people might be going through. Right? All those things. Why is that important for moral ability? Because it helps you be less selfish and get outside your own head. That's right. That's right. It's going to encourage us not to just be stuck in what I want at the moment. And morality is always about more than what I want at the moment. Right? It doesn't mean we always have to discount what I want at the moment, but it is always about more than what I want at the moment. So I need to be able to get away from myself and try to feel with or experience with this other person. What's moral imagination then? What would that be like? It would probably rely on empathy. Because probably moral imagination is what we want to do to imagine the best possible responses to a moral situation. Right? And that's very likely going to include some kind of empathy. OK. Yes. So this means that actually caring is in many ways more difficult than rule-based thinking, or even pluralist kind of principle thinking. And there are a number of reasons for that. One of them is that caring recognizes that the ground for decision making is always ambiguity. So what is ambiguity? The unknown, uncertainty. There's no clear, obvious, one true answer. Why would the ethics of care notice that or think that that's reality. What does ambiguity have to do with our moral decision making? Well, not 100% sure the outcome, it can seem kind of unsure about it. Yeah. And so, when was the last time you were 100% sure? about the outcome of a moral situation, especially a serious moral situation. I don't feel like people usually are. You what? I don't feel like people usually are. Yeah, probably we usually aren't. Why not? How come you're not 100% sure? 
You have to make a moral decision. What, what keeps you from being 100% sure? Maybe just because it's your interaction with another person and other people are unpredictable. So one thing is that other people are unpredictable. It's certainly not me. I'm not unpredictable. It's always those other people, right? You know what you're going to do, but you don't know how they're going to react to it. Sure. Sure. You don't know what, how other people are going to react. And in fact, you don't know for sure what it is that other people want in a moral situation. Even if you ask them, you can't always be entirely certain that they are telling you what they want or that they know what they want. So part of the uncertainty is because other people are involved. What's another part of the uncertainty? The you don't know the outcome. Certainty requires that we know what the outcome is. And generally, in a moral situation, you actually don't know everything about the outcome. There can be big holes in that outcome. And one of the things that we realize about moral decision making is that it's very, very often the case that, especially with a serious moral situation, there will be outcomes that are very, very good for some people and outcomes that are perhaps very not good for other people. That is, in most of the moral situations that are serious, there's going to be good and bad outcomes. This is the uh, intuition of utilitarianism, right? This is why what utilitarianism says when you get down to more specifics, maximize the good while at the same time minimizing the pain to the greatest number of people. Because utilitarianism recognizes straightforwardly that most moral situations are going to produce both pleasure and pain, or both benefit and disadvantage, both good and bad. Well, what that means is that our ability to predict situations is pretty complex. And it doesn't rest on certainty. It rests on probability at best. So we're going to have some ambiguity around our decision making. And that is probably always going to be the case. Now, some decisions you may feel much, much more secure about than others. That will depend entirely on you, your situation, the resources available to you, other people involved, how well you know them, how well you're able to predict, how well the consequences can be contained and understood ahead of time, all kinds of things. But some decisions might be much easier to make in terms of certainty, right? So, my decision in my example about somebody falling down on the quad, I feel like that one's pretty easy to predict. I think the outcome there's, yeah, that's, that's a pretty easy one. They've got pain. Their pain will continue until we get them some help. I'm right here. I need to help. That one seems pretty easy, right? Unfortunately, not all of them are going to be that easy. Like the decision the senators are facing tonight. I knew that would be well, that, that would be, yeah, yeah where we've got uh, <laughs> all of this. It's a good time for this. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's an incredibly good example of all kinds of problematics of decision making. One of them being, you know, are we making this decision on the basis of moral principles or caring? Or what are the foundational principles or ideals that are probably going to guide this decision? It would probably be really good if it was ethics. It's probably not going to be. 
sorry for sorry for being uh, pessimistic there. Assuming that that sounds pessimistic to you, it just sounds kind of real to me. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, another reason that caring is difficult is that it entails emotional risk. So how could caring entail emotional risk? What kind of emotional risk is there in caring? You involve your own emotions. You risk then, therefore, being hurt yourself. Exactly. You risk being hurt yourself. To care for others is always to open yourself up to a response from them. Responses from other people are not always kind and generous. Even when we are caring for them, those responses are not always kind and generous. So just opening ourselves to relationship is, in general, an emotional risk. Again, we can't predict what is going to come back to us in a relationship. And we don't control it. So there will always be some risk involved there. Um, because in the world we live in, caring is not evenly practiced or engaged in. So some people may end up doing more of the work than others, or feeling like they've been wronged simply because they cared <coughs> rather than chose an easier path. Does that make sense? Yeah? Why does that make sense? Some people don't care as much. <laughs> <laughs> or some people are more self-involved. Some people are less likely to notice, you know, whatever. And there are people who probably been, who tried to care, but then that one burned as a result of that. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Absolutely. And the fact is that we've got systematic distributions of caring work in our society that place the burden unevenly, don't they? Who does most of the caring work in our society? Women. Women and people of color. Yeah. So that means that the risks of caring and the burden of caring is unevenly distributed and that some people are going to be expected to do more of it than others. That might be in the home. It will also very likely be in all of the workplaces that you go to, in all kinds of situations across your lives. Right? Yeah. So that is something to be aware of. And it's something, hopefully, to work on, right? We need to encourage a different kind of training for caring work. Is your hand? Ultimately, it may come down to your ability to answer the question, what do I want my life to be about? That is, it may come down to your doing the long-term thinking required by this question, because that might help you imagine what you want to be the meaning of your life overall as a whole, and thus to decide whether you will be guided by the goal of success or the goal of excellence. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are at least two different ways to envision what success means. On the one hand, we can, oh, sorry, we can think of success as excellence, or we can think of success as efficiency. And efficiency is often associated with things like making money. So where do we see this version of success encouraged? In business, absolutely. We see that encouraged in business. The 
idea of the bottom line is continually pushed, and the bottom line is what in business? Profit. The bottom line is profit in business. It's not ethics. Right? Generally speaking, where do we see this encouraged in our society? In school. So what does it mean to be excellent in school? This is very big talk in, for instance, liberal arts land, which is where you all are. I think excellence like, is more in terms of all around, so not just academics, but maybe also like, the community, the character, yeah. that's just all around person. Yeah, when we talk about being excellent, we don't just mean get good grades. We also mean things like, you know, and it's not always particularly well spelled out, is it? So we often mean things like uh, be a good person, be a contributor to your community, give back. But these aren't like mutually exclusive concepts at all. They are not. Like there is a professor here who probably worked here to make good pay, right? Well, maybe a couple, I don't know. <laughs> But I have to imagine that they have to live, right? So you can't have, like, I mean, those aren't exclusive, so. Right. Um, yeah. Just yeah. like in any business, right? You're not necessarily immoral or unethical just to make money. You can make money while having a very ethical business. Presumably you can. Now, it, it might be that there are cases where people argue that you can't. I, maybe. But. For the most part, it certainly looks like there's no reason to see these as mutually exclusive. It really looks like if we were working hard to do it, we could incorporate both of these in the same version, understanding of success. But we probably are, are not being strongly encouraged to or at least not strongly enough encouraged to, that the excellence idea will work to mitigate the effect of the efficiency idea of success. Does that make sense? That is, in many, many cases, and, and you know, you're looking at, you're looking at um, legal cases and business ethics cases in this class in which this is exactly what the problem is. Ethics and profit come into conflict with each other, which one is likely to get jettisoned? It's not usually profit. So when they do come into conflict with each other, it's often believed that profit or efficiency or making money is the one that we need to go with. And we often justify that in terms of keeping the business afloat. Now, here, again, imagination is a key. Because you might try to imagine a whole bunch of things. One of the things you might try to imagine is, is there a way to bring excellence and efficiency together in the situation that I am working with? instead of just assuming that efficiency or profit is the right goal, that could be an exercise of imagination that you could undertake. You could try to imagine something different if you're thinking about you and your life goals and what you would like to see yourself as. One of the things that you can imagine is what the people whose opinions you care most about would say about you or to you in response to your choices. That is, one way to think about whether you believe you are making the right choice is for you to imagine if this is Mommy Monday and I'm talking to mom and I tell mom about this latest decision-making procedure that we had to go through and what I decided and why I decided it. 
is mom going to be proud of me? Or is she going to think I should have done something else? Or think about your partners. Or think about your best friends, right? Are the people whose opinions I care about, are they going to support me in this? Or am I going to feel like I need to actually just not tell them about it? Just keep silent. Because I'm afraid I'm going to get their disapprobation instead of their approval. I think that's a pretty big indicator to you of whether what you are doing is contributing to your sort of picture of yourself over the course of your life and what you want to be, how you want to see yourself, right? So you can think, what do I want to be able to say about myself at the end of my life? And will I be able to say it honestly? Or am I going to have to fudge a lot to be able to say what I would like to say? Right? So again, imagination is a, a really important piece of our moral work because it can do a lot of different things for us and help us keep on a path that we actually believe is a morally good path instead of, you know, falling off the edge, so to speak. Into the swamp that needs to be drained. Okay. Well, caring isn't perfect. As far as I can see, there is no moral theory that is perfect. That is, there's no moral theory that very easily solves all of everybody's problems in exactly the way that they would like to do it. Some of the particular problems or limits with regard to caring include these. One of the things is that caring has to be reciprocated or we burn out. Right? So caring is heavy work. And if nobody is caring for me, I'm not going to be able to continue to do it indefinitely, right? So what that means is that caring has to be shared because no one person can do it all. I care for some people, other people care for me, or I care for this person, this person cares for me back, depending on what our relationship is. We mutually support each other. We work in networks of caring. We make sure that everybody who is caring for someone is also cared for by someone. Another thing is that, that the caring that needs to be done has to be feasible. And it has to be appropriate. So feasible just means if I'm the one who has to care, it has to be possible for me to do it. Right? I can't care for somebody in a way that is just totally out of my abilities. So for instance, if the person who has fallen down on the sidewalk has broken a bone, I can't set the bone for them because I don't know how to do that. So it's not going to be me who does that caring for the person. What I can do is call emergency services. I can call other people that they would like to be called. I can offer moral support. You know, I can say, hang in there. I think it's going to be OK. They're on their way. They're coming. I can put a pillow under your head. I can get you a drink. I can, you know, Those are things I can do. But I can't set bones. And the caring has to be appropriate. So one of the things that we have to recognize is that we don't always give people what they want if what they want is not good. And we have to recognize also that want is not the same as need, right? And that can be kind of tough because I think we're encouraged in our world to conflate want and need. 
so that we will buy more things, right? So the best likelihood is that you don't need the newest version of an Apple phone or any other kind of technology. But you might want it really bad. And we can certainly see this really clearly when we think about you know, what we do to care for children. Children might want to eat an entire bag of candy. We don't let them do that because it's not good for them, right? We probably shouldn't let anybody do that, but you know, once people are grown ups, they have to make those choices for themselves unless they're asking for help on it. But for kids, you know, you take your kids out for Halloween, you bring them back with a bag of candy, you don't just let them eat all the candy in five minutes because it's never good. So the caring has to be appropriate. It has to be something that is actually good for the person. And that might not actually be what they are asking for. So sometimes the best caring we do is to say no. Or, no, I will not do this for you. What I will do is this. The caring that we exhibit has to respect the one that's being cared for. That is, it has to treat them as people who are due moral consideration, as people who deserve good from us. It's not always going to look the same because the relationships we have with different people are not always the same, right? I'm not going to care for a five-year-old in the same way that I'm going to care for a 25-year-old, right? Because I don't show respect to a five-year-old exactly the same way that I do to a 25-year-old. A five-year-old, I'm still going to manage some of their life for them. That's not disrespectful. It's caring. That's part of caring for them. But a 25-year-old, I'm not going to manage their life for them because it's not appropriate. They need support to manage their lives themselves, and I need to offer support for that. And sometimes we might have to withdraw if the one cared for will not accept appropriate caring. That is, especially in the interest of the idea that caring has to be reciprocated or we burn out. If we are attempting to care for someone and they are refusing our care, we may need to withdraw. Can you think of a situation that might be like that? Yeah. Um, like somebody who has to struggle with alcoholism, they're not getting better until they want to. Yeah, maybe someone who's struggling with addiction. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone who is abusive. Right? It might be that we need to withdraw. So, again, caring has to be appropriate. Part of what appropriate means is that we have to protect ourselves, and we protect ourselves and our ability to continue caring into the future. Sometimes that means withdraw. That's a kind of tough love notion, right? And in fact, the ethics of care is likely to be fairly strict because it's recognizing all these limitations on the carer and because it's looking at ethics in terms of the relationships that we have with each other. And those relationships have to be guarded, but one of the ways that we guard them is by setting some boundaries. Caring for someone doesn't mean I'm a doormat. So I set boundaries with regard to the care that I can appropriately give someone. And when someone tries to push past that, I say no. That's not what I'm willing or in a position to do. I will care in this way or in this way. I will not care in this way. 
So the ethics of care may be kind of strict, but it is also supportive and it tends to be corrective. That is, it tends to try to work to offer people ideas about how to correct what is going wrong. And that's part of relationship work too. Caring is primarily, not primarily interested in judging, but is interested in responding to need. Again, not want, but need. So, heightening moral perception and sensitivity, and heightening our ability and willingness to respond to the needs of others in relationship. That's what caring is interested in. This also suggests that the ideas of right and wrong express our commitments, but that is perhaps all they express in caring. So we decide in caring what to do, not on the basis of what is right and what is wrong, but on the basis of what can be done to meet the needs of the one who requires care. Does that make sense? It's not so much about judging, it's about recognizing what the needs are in a situation and then evaluating whether it is possible to respond to those needs and whether it is appropriate to respond to those needs. Given the resources available, given who is available, right? These are the kinds of assessments we're going to do more than, oh, this is right or this is wrong. Justification is, not also the, is also not the primary project for caring. Moral claims are not truths in the same way that we say facts are. In caring, moral claims are expressions of care, and care doesn't really have to be justified. What does have to be justified is the refusal to care. Worries about justification actually deflect our attention away from the responsibility to actually get the caring done. So again, this is not the project of caring. Justification is not where we're going to spend our time. We're going to spend our time figuring out what actually can be done. OK, so let me just take questions at what, of, on what we've done so far. Um, what would you like to say? What are you thinking? Is it making sense? Does it seem workable? You see how to apply it? So no questions? <laughs> okay, all right. Then we're going to move on to a, a new topic. We're going to talk for just a few minutes about Adam Smith, whom I assume is um, someone you are familiar with, at least by name. Um, what do you know about Adam Smith? <laughs> Invisible hands. No, the invisible hand. And what does the invisible hand mean? Louder. That government should stay out of business. Laissez faire economics. Yeah. Yes, he wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations. Anybody read it? Little, little bits of it, maybe. That snippet where he said that one time about the invisible hand. Right? I think it is that one time. That's about it. So very, very interesting that that has become a major piece of our discourse about politics and economics. Um, it's probably a pretty big misread of Adam Smith. 
best likelihood is that the invisible hand that Smith was talking about was the hand of God and not big government. God, he would have assumed, even bigger than big government. But what we're going to be thinking about is work that is uh, written in the other big book he did, which is called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which has a lot of kind of connections with the ethics of care that we've been looking at. Because it is a ground, an ethics that is grounded in the idea of sentiments. What are sentiments? Louder? Not thoughts usually, but feelings. Yeah. Sentiments are feelings usually, emotions, what you feel. So this is a different version of ethics grounded in sentiments or feelings and caring. What Smith says is that there are two main impulses of feeling in humans. One is approval, expressed as sympathy. That is, when we are sympathetic to others, we are approving of them. And the other one is disapproval, which is expressed as resentment. So this is the language he would have used in his time. When you disapprove of somebody, you resent them. So sympathy means feeling what we would feel in the other person's situation. So that's not feeling exactly what they would feel, right? So it's often differentiated from empathy, which is usually about feeling what other people would feel. Sympathy is, what would I feel like if I were in that situation? So it's self-referential, right? On the basis of this, we can gain some understanding and can respond with compassion or kindness or generosity or patience, etc. That is, on the basis of this connection that we can make, where we exercise sympathy and feel what we would feel if we were in that person's situation, we can imagine what we would like people to do for us in that situation and take that as the model for what we should do for them. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, so if my person who fell down on the quad is there and I'm doing the Adam Smith version, I could be saying to myself, oh, what would I feel like if I, if I had done that? And, you know, I know what that would feel like because I have done that. So I would imagine then, I could imagine what I would want somebody to be doing for me in that situation. And I could use my imaginative picture there as a guide for what I think I should do, right? What I would want is, you know, for somebody to be really nice to me and give me the pillow for my head and maybe give me some water and call the emergency services, right? Do all those things for me and say nice things. Tell me to hang in there. And get me moved along as quickly as possible to the, next, to the next phase of my recovery with some generosity and kindness, right? Oh, okay, well then that's what I should do for them. Okay, so this again requires moral imagination. Resentment refers to what we feel in response to wrongdoing. So when someone has done something wrong, to us, has treated us badly, we can talk about our feelings in response to that as resentment. Right? This feeling is important because it's a moral indicator. It tells us when we believe something wrong has been done. So what Smith thinks is, it's working like this. It's not so much that I think something wrong has happened, so now I feel resentment. It's, I feel resentment. Oh, that means I think you have just done something wrong to me. Does that make sense? The feeling itself is my moral indicator. It tells me what I believe about this situation. So, its proper function, though, is an indicator only. We don't act out of resentment. 
We are simply informed by resentment. So to act out of resentment, my impulse might be, right, oh, let's see, let's do a different scenario. Let's say that we're, you know, 10-year-old siblings, and I just discovered that my 10-year-old sibling has stolen and broken one of my favorite things. And I feel resentment. To act out of resentment would probably make me have an impulse to take one of his things and break it. Or smack him. You know, either way. Would probably be satisfying. What Smith is saying is that resentment is not what we ought to act on. It's what we need to listen to so that we will understand what the situation means. Then Smith introduces this very interesting thought experiment that he calls the impartial spectator. The impartial spectator is an imaginary device, a thought experiment intended to help us think about or imagine what's appropriate in any given situation. So we can ask ourselves, what would a well-informed, well-educated, thoughtful, reflective person who has developed sensitivity and proper feeling say about this situation? What would they recommend? So now he's not saying that we can gain a perfectly unbiased perspective. What he's saying is the impartial spectator represents a perspective that we should adopt to look at moral situations. And he thinks that this is the perspective we should adopt because it's our best attempt at a perspective that makes up for our own particular flaws. That is, if I'm trying to adopt the perspective of a well-informed person, well, that would make up for any flaw in my own information. If I'm attempting to adopt a well-educated perspective, now I'm trying to make up for any lack in my own <coughs> education. If I'm trying to adopt a thoughtful or reflective perspective, what I'm trying to do is counter any tendencies I might have to be overly impulsive and to not be thoughtful. Right, does that make sense? So Smith thinks this is the best perspective for us to try to adopt in order to reflect on and consider the moral situation we find ourselves in. It's not a real person's perspective, but it's the perspective of someone who is as unbiased as we can manage to imagine ourselves into. And of course, the more we actually know about our own biases, the better we will be able to work at countering them and attempting to imagine ourselves into a perspective that does not rely on them. Does that make sense? So a really important part of the exercise would be for us to do the work that allows us to know what our biases actually are. Okay, now a few sort of general world words about making moral decisions. Moral decision making is difficult even if we have good moral standards. Anybody? Had that experience? You feel like you've got good moral standards, everybody? Yeah, you probably do. Most of us do. But you still are likely to experience difficulty in making moral decisions. So the question might be, well, why is that? And I think there are a couple of reasons. One of them is that we face two different kinds of conflict, I think, in moral decision making. One is conflicts in understanding what is right. And the other one is conflicts in making ourselves do what we believe is the right thing to do. Right? So those are conflicts at two different levels. One's at the level of understanding, one's at the level of action. Responding to conflicts in understanding what is right, we use critical thinking skills. So 
in responding to the conflicts about understanding, this is about bringing our critical thinking skills to, get to bear in order to discern what is going on in our situation, what's the information we need, how do we put the information together to come to an understanding of what is the right thing to do. And that might involve things like gathering information to create the best possible understanding, working to articulate the values that are in the situation that seem to be at stake, using moral theories to try to negotiate an understanding, putting rules or values or obligations together, put consequences and loyalty into play, attempt to provide reasons for prioritizing one or another of those things over the others, and deliberating, weighing considerations about options. Listening to your moral intuition and checking it with the intuitions of others that you trust. But also, using your reflective skills to be honest with yourself about how often your intuition is good and how often it seems to lead you wrong. Right? Intuition can be tricky. So you have to reflect on how well your intuition works. And you have to be honest with yourself. Responding to conflicts in doing what is right, on the other hand, this is about the problems of want versus need, or want versus what is right, or want versus ought and of pressures on us that push us in a variety of directions. So here, we're not so much using critical thinking skills as we are using the skills of our moral development and our moral sensibilities, like moral imagination, empathy, imaginative empathy, or our moral sentiments, character, or virtue, or caring, Right, the kinds of moral training that we have learned throughout the course of our lives, which is being kind of clarified for you in courses like this, where you talk about what these things are and how they work. These things, these moral skills and abilities enable us to do things like to see in and through perspectives, that is, to see through the lives and experiences of others as well as ourselves. That's not critical thinking as much as it is imaginative thinking. What's it like to be that person? What's their experience in this situation? Seeing through the eyes of others. These kinds of moral skills help us place things in perspective, that is, Help us place our, self, our own self-interest, our goals, our needs, our desires, and those of others into play together, right? Recognizing that I might have needs and interests in this situation, but in fact, mine might not be the ones that ought to win, right? That's a really important moral skill to come to, is the ability to recognize when you're not the one who ought to win. Somebody else needs to win in this situation. Recognizing when the needs of others should be prioritized over your own. Picturing what the best possible solution would be. And hopefully integrating these different notions of best, efficiency or success, and excellence of person and action. Hopefully integrating them. Also recognizing different notions of best for. That is, when we talk about what is best to do in this situation, what do we mean? Is it best for me? Is it best for my business? Is it best for my colleagues? Is it best for the community? We need to specify what we're talking about when we say, this is what is best to do. And these moral skills will help us work to tell a coherent and intelligible moral story. That is, part of our work in understanding a moral situation is to tell a story about what's going on. What matters? To whom does it matter? Why does it matter? How did this happen? Who am I and what's my place in this problem or story? How can I and others make sense out of this situation? 
Why do we hold the values that we hold, right? This is a kind of story we can tell about ourselves. We can narrate a moral understanding for ourselves. And these moral skills will help us choose, hopefully to choose what is good, choose what is best, recognizing honestly what version of best we are choosing for. Does that make sense? Again, am I choosing what's best for me? Am I choosing what's best for my kids? Am I choosing what's best for my community? What version of best am I choosing for? And we need to be able to see that honestly. How much time do we have left? Are we five minutes? Okay. To face these conflicts in decision making, we also need to develop ourselves. For example, we need to work on moderating our own desires so that more important objectives can be fulfilled. And one of the things that we might do to think about that is just learning how to feel enough instead of feeling more. Instead of feeling all the time, I need more or I want more, we should work at feeling, oh, OK, this is good. OK, enough. OK, this is good. Enough. This is good. I don't need more. Right? That's a way of moderating desire. We need to develop a reliable ability to articulate our moral beliefs and values. And in order to do that, you have to make sure you know what you believe about what is right and how to see it in any given situation. But it will also always be important to check with other people, especially other people whose moral sensibilities you trust. Right? Don't check with people whose moral decision making you think is crappy. That won't help. We need to develop a reliable impulse to do what we believe to be right. That is, we need to train ourselves to want to do what is the right thing to do. And you need to learn to trust. You need to learn when to trust your gut or your heart, your intuition, and when not to. And learn to ask others for help in doing right. Learn courage to say and do what is right, as well as courage to ask for help. It's interesting that courage is probably one of the more important things we need to develop for moral ability, but it's not the one that we talk about the most. In the business context, in particular in business, we have issues with the second kind of conflict, that is conflicts of doing, because the norms of business may come into conflict with the norms of morality. That is, we may have cultural or corporate pressure on us to value success over excellence, or business over relationships and community, or desire over need. So be prepared. Train your moral sentiments and feelings, Develop your virtues, perhaps especially moral courage. Engage in moral discussion with others. Don't avoid moral discussion. Engage in moral discussion. Practice it. Know yourself. Know what you believe. Know what you can live with and what you can't live with. Articulate a process or a set of principles or theory that you can follow and then follow it. OK? Any final questions or comments? All right, good luck with the rest of the semester. I hope it goes really well for you. Thank you.